In the 27 years he's been with Magna International, Don Walker has seen the company become a global powerhouse in the auto parts industry. Magna's CEO plans to add billions in new international work over the next two years. Inside Magna's new plant near Monterey, Mexico, workers put together powertrains for many of the world's automakers, an investment Magna needed to make. Manufacturers have been pouring billions into new assembly lines here. Mexico's auto industry has accelerated so dramatically, it's pushed past Canada to become North America's second biggest producer. Locating here, Magna keeps its customers happy and positions itself to capture more of Mexico's growing business. Today, Magna's international footprint covers 29 countries across the globe. With more than 300 auto part plants employing more than 130,000 people, the company has come a long way from this Toronto warehouse where Frank Stronach started it back in 1957. Stronach's colorful and sometimes controversial leadership made him a lightning rod for critics who saw his outsized earnings and indulgences like horse racing as distractions from Magna's main business of making auto parts. Stronach, who left the company completely in 2011, hired Don Walker back in 1987. By then, Stronach had built Magna into a billion-dollar business. Two years later, the auto industry took a nosedive. Magna's massive debt threatened its survival. Massive cuts managed to save it. Meanwhile, Don Walker's working relationship with Stronach's daughter Belinda led to their marriage in 1990. Seven years and two kids later, the couple divorced. Walker remained part of the Magna family, though. In 2005, Frank Stronach promoted him to co-CEO, and since 2010, he's held the top job solo. Walker's moved Magna into a globally competitive $36 billion business. When we talked recently, I wanted to know if he could remember a moment when he knew the company was going to become a big and important Canadian firm. I worked at General Motors for eight years beforehand, and I uh, actually wanted to get into the business of the parts manufacturing side. So I'd heard of Magna, I'd heard the name Frank Stronach, and I met Frank, and that was back when the company was, a, I think it was about a billion and a half Canadian, and they'd been growing very rapidly, didn't really know too much about them. Uh, but then we had a big downturn, it was in the 88, 89, and they had a lot of debt and programs were delayed, so really struggled, and that's when uh, Frank Stronach, the founder, uh, had to do a lot of work to make sure the company did not under and we downsized the company quite a bit back then so we ended up being plus or minus a billion dollar US company back then um, they were very unique in uh, going after a lot of different products and launching things so they were they were a successful company back then but whether they would survive long term you know, it, it, a bit unknown I mean it was a big company but uh, it has grown steadily and a lot of the reasons grown steadily is because of the the structure, the motivation to attract really good people, very entrepreneurial, very decentralized. So we've changed a lot of that now, but uh, it certainly is very important in the, in the Canadian economy, in the automotive industry now. How much of that early culture of the place was really driven by Stronach? And when you, when you came in, how much of it then was about your relationship? Well, Frank hired me directly, so I was working with him, but uh, Frank w is very entrepreneurial and is doing a lot of different things, even back then. Fred Gingle was running the company, and Fred was very, uh, he, was, he was the architect of a lot of the new products we got into. So it was, uh, it was a very hectic, chaotic company, uh, which I, I didn't really understand when I first went there, because I came from a very organized, structured, very engineering-driven company. So the, um, a lot of the, the structure, the, the pay, the compensation, our employees' charter, uh, all those things really came from Frank. Uh, and Fred Gingle was also, and, and a lot of others were also instrumental in it as well. You uh, not only had this relationship with, with Frank, and I think sometimes you would, you would say you clashed, didn't always agree, but a strong relationship. You not only managed to be his son-in-law, you married his daughter, uh, but you managed to be his ex-son-in-law successfully. Does that say more about you or Frank or both of you? Well, when I, when I was going to leave General Motors, I was going to go off my own, start my own company. So Frank uh, had convinced me to come and work at Magna. I thought, well, it would be interesting to see what Magna's like and learn the auto parts side. So I wasn't really wedded to staying at Magna, quite frankly, and thought I, I would only stay for a couple of years. My relationship with Frank was almost always more of a business relationship. And Frank is a very big thinker, very worldly. So my relationship with Blinda didn't last that long. And uh, when we were... 
uh, going our separate ways, I called Franklin and said, Frank, I'm going to move on, but let's have a, a logical transition. But we come through a very difficult time at that point in time. The stock price was doing very well. I think we had a very good relationship with our customers. Uh, so I think Frank, fr we always got along anyway, and uh, Frank's view was why would, why would uh, break up a relationship change the way he and I worked together and the company was, in, uh, was doing a lot of good things. So uh, I, I think we were both very open-minded and Frank has always had, he, he always takes the uh, big picture view of, of everything and he did back then as well. You also had to manage through a tough transition that saw the end of the Frank Stronic era from an investor point of view, from a management point of view. How tough was that? Uh, it wasn't tough. I mean, it, it was different. Uh, back in 92, I became chief operating officer. We didn't really have a CEO, so I was the CEO from 1994 to 2000. So I knew the company extremely well. And then we were spinning off companies, uh, and so I took one public and I came back five years later, uh, Magna bought the company back, I came back as co-CEO. So uh, when we uh, did the deal and bought Frank out of his control block, I had been running operations for a long time uh, and knew the customers. So it was a lot of corporate governance changes happened then, but, you know, and, and we, we did a lot of things uh, because we went to one CEO, so I, I did a lot of things with the common structure and global group presence, and so a lot of other things which I just felt needed to be done with the company. Were there growing pains? Were there moments when this company that began, you know, in a garage is now a giant global foot player and footprint and internationally recognized? Uh, were there moments where you the, there was learning about that, how you become that giant global player? Uh, sure. I think every company goes through evolution. We've got a really big uh, effort going on for many years now to be the best in the world at world-class manufacturing, uh, a global uh, people development system, looking at innovation. So it, it really has been an evolution. We've also um, gone from offering a lot of different products to saying we want to specialize in fewer products but being the best in the world in those. So looking at acquisitions and where we spend our money and, and technology, innovation, things like that. So it's been, uh, it's been a long time and uh, we just sort of some, somebody has t told me we're, we're a very plodding company. Uh, I, I, we, have a, we know where we want to go. We've got a vision we want to be. We've got our priorities, and we just keep executing. You are obviously reliant on a healthy auto industry, uh, and you have big and deep relationships with the North American auto manufacturers. How tough or frightening uh, was it when they seemed to be at the brink after the credit crisis? Well, back in 08, 09, when the industry was literally cut in half in North America, uh, and it was questionable whether a couple of car makers were, were going to make it without uh, some intervention being able to restructure the balance sheet. Uh, it, it was very difficult. Magna would have survived, one of the few parts suppliers that would have survived because we had a lot of cash and we had, we had no net debt. However, it would have been an extremely uh, tough time uh, had one of them or a couple of car companies gone into restructuring or bankruptcy because a lot of the auto industry, the parts industry would have gone bankrupt and they would have stopped shipping parts. And my belief is the whole industry in North America would have come to a halt for three months, six months. It would have been a disaster. There would have been millions of people out of, out of work. I don't think the politicians understood it. That's why they took the, 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 east, um, the actions they did, but it would have been a disaster on top of everything else that was going on then. So it was a very difficult time, but like anything else you look at, what can you control? And we looked at our uh, cutting back in the areas and looked at our cash flow and so we would have survived but uh, it would have been difficult. And how does it feel now? Does it feel as though uh, that vibrancy is back and your ability to innovate for your, your biggest customers is alive and well? Well the industry is doing, doing well. Uh, we are a very big supplier to Ford, GM, Chrysler, BMW, Mercedes, uh, Jag Jaguar, Land Rover. We do a lot of business with uh, Nissan. Uh, so we're, we're big with most of the car companies in the world. Uh, and the industry is growing from plus or minus 80 million vehicles are built a year now. It'll, everybody is projecting it'll get to be over 100 million. So it's a, it is a growing industry no matter what happens with the economic cycles. So we, we believe that um, we should be able to continue to outgrow the market. Uh, the automotive industry is uh, going up, but we think we can grow faster just because we've been, I think we're one of the better parts makers out there.
Canada's auto industry seems to have reached a turning point. Automakers are moving assembly plants to low-cost locations around the world, leaving some plants here at home facing uncertainty about the future. Magna International built its business supplying those automakers. CEO Don Walker plans to follow his customers wherever they go. Meanwhile, in Mexico, it's a different story. Automakers have poured almost $23 billion into production plants there in the last few years. Magna International, Canada's dominant auto parts producer, is investing right along with them. Despite record sales, Canada's automotive manufacturing industry has been reeling since the 2008 credit crisis led to billions in government bailouts of General Motors and Chrysler. Meanwhile, Mexico has passed Canada in production. We were concerned that we weren't getting the same level of investment as we did in the past. An unmistakable trend Ontario is trying to stop, appointing this former Toyota executive as the province's new auto czar, looking for strategies to keep auto assembly plants in Canada. In the second part of our conversation, I wanted to know what Magna CEO Don Walker makes of the trend and what, if anything, can be done about it. I think everybody is very motivated to try and uh, do what we, we have to do, but certainly with the Canadian dollar coming back down to 80 cents US dollar, it will help because it's at par. I think it's very difficult to compete. You need to look at um, trade uh, with Europe as an example because uh, a lot of people go to Mexico because of that. So I think we, it should be a high priority for Canada to keep the automotive assemblers here and keep them growing. If we can attract new ones, that's great as well. But I think there's a, a good chance we can keep the people who are here if we have the right policies and if we make sure we're competitive on energy prices and make sure anything else we may be doing are not going to put a, an added burden to companies that make them say, well, I'd be better off going somewhere else. Because it's a global industry. They make decisions where they can make the most money, just like we do. Uh, we're, I think we're, we spent about $250 million in new capital in Canada last year within Magna. And we're going to spend more than that this year. We've been averaging over 150 million for many years. So we still find it a, a competitive place to do business. But if all the assembly plants go, then a lot of the parts industry would go over a period of time. We, I was, as you know, in your Magna plant um, down in Monterey, looking at exactly this, this the, the allure of the Mexican uh, market to assemble and then ship to Europe. Trade was a big theme. Um, so though was productivity. Your plant manager says your operations there increase their productivity six to eight percent a year, which seems to me to be uh, pretty appealing. Well, uh, my philosophy is if, uh, you sh if you can't improve your efficiency and productivity by a minimum of three percent per year, then you might as well go to the business. My personal opinion is everybody should be doing that, including the governments on, on all areas. So. Uh, you know, our, our, we have to give money back to our customers every year. A lot of people look at that as a bizarre model, but they can demand reduction. So we look at our purchase parts, um, how fast we can make things, balancing cycle times, reducing scrap, cost and non-quality, a lot of technical terms, uh, but we expect it of our, of our plants and our customers expect it and we do a good job of it. And that's one of the reasons why we continue to win new business. We're going to be launching five billion dollars, U.S. dollars, of additional work between 2015 and 2017. And the only reason we get that business is because we're competitive and we're, and we're quoting. Where is, that, where is that five billion dollars located? It'll be all over the world. We have, uh, it's more, we're launching more than 20 new plants and about half of those are roughly, would be in Asia, a lot of those in China. But we are expanding uh, in Mexico, in the U.S., in, uh, in Eastern Europe. We're not expanding with new plants in Canada because we don't need any more. We've already got, I think it's 47 here. So we don't need more plants, but we are expanding a lot of the plants we have here, which is, which is driving employment, and, and that's why we've got almost 20,000 people in our plants in Canada now. We also heard from folks in Mexico that those trade deals you alluded to are a big part of the appeal. Uh, the cars assembled there, of course, get to Europe tariff-free. No. What's your message to, you know, the government obviously here is aware that we want to keep the industry, attract new investment. What's your message on getting the deal with the Europeans done? The, the government understands that, but uh, free trade with Europe is, is something I think that would be good because we're trading with a, with a market that will be open, so we can make cars here and sell them there. There's not going to be uh, any uh, tariff, like sort of fake tariff barriers there. So I think with Europe, it'll, it'll be good and you'll, you'll probably get more investment in Canada and the U.S. Whether it comes to Canada or U.S. depends on other factors, but I think that will help. And they know that and they're working on it. 
Where does the innovation come from for you? Does it come from collaboration with your customers? Does it actually originate in kind of pure innovation inside Magna? Yeah, I love talking about innovation actually because everything is in our, in our industry is driven by product and there's a lot of tech, a lot of things coming up like CO2 reduction and weight reduction and fuel economy which are driving the need for a lot of technological change and so our customers looking to us for that. Uh, Magna would be known as a very good manufacturing company. What, what we aren't known for as well and we got to do a better job I guess promoting it, uh, but we have a lot of technology, product and manufacturing process technology. And that comes from working with universities, we're, we're working with venture capital companies to see what new products they've got out there for manufacturing or just an end product. We work with their customers, we do internal work. So uh, we've been spending a lot more time recently and long term, if we're, if we're world class manufacturing and we have great technology, my personal opinion is we're, we're unstoppable. Where we end up going around the world depends on where our customers want us to be. So some people are worried, not just about auto parts or auto manufacturing, but manufacturing in Canada, period that where we can't compete is on labor costs. Is that a fair concern? I mean, we have a kind of a embedded view of what these jobs should be worth that isn't really competitive with other jurisdictions. Well, if you look over a 50 year time horizon, a uh, place like China used to be ex like, very difficult to compete, but their wages are going up quite dramatically, and not just for direct labor, but indirect skilled trades, uh, engineers, program managers, that we're paying them as much in China as we are here now. So over time, everything sort of balances out. Uh, we, again, we do competitive wage and benefit surveys, so can you afford to pay somebody all in $60 an hour and, and compete with other regions of the world? Probably not. So uh, one of the difficult realities of the world is I wouldn't want to be running, uh, say, Unifor because they want to protect jobs and attract investment, but also trying to keep their standard of living up for their employees. But they've also got to be looking at how can we not price ourselves out of the market. And one of the ways to do that, quite frankly, is to be is to really be good at, at continuous improvement and, and getting more done with, with fewer people. Is that the hope in auto and elsewhere that they that Canada Canadians can hang on to that sliver of of the pie, the higher end, the innovative end, and maybe give up the shop floor? No, I don't think we have to give up the shop floor because the assembly plant is uh, there's a lot of labor there, but it's probably only eight, ten percent of the total cost of the car. So a, a much bigger part of, the, of their cost comes from the supply base, like companies like Magna. So if, and they can shop that around the world. So if they can, if the assembly plants are, are at least competitive and we can keep them here and uh, they can run multiple platforms and global platforms and they're flexible, then, and I think we can. I was worried back in the uh, downturn of 08 or 09 if it all left uh, the continent, it wasn't coming back, but it, we've kept a lot of it. So I think we, we can remain competitive and and the, supply, and the part supply industry is competitive here, so it's not easy, it's tough competition, but uh, that, that's life. How big do you think Magna can be before you're through with it? We were $36 billion US last year, and the, the, the industry is roughly about 10, uh, sorry, it's about a trillion dollars. Take about $10,000 of parts per vehicle on average, 100 million vehicles. So we're only three, three and a half percent of the, uh, of the market. We don't make every part in a car, but we have lots of room to grow, and I've, I've yet to hear from a customer that they think we're getting too big with them. Uh, in fact, the opposite is true. If anything, our customers want us to be more competitive. They always want lower prices, but they, they all want to grow with us. So you know, I, I don't know how big we can get, but as long as we continue to grow our top, top line and bottom line at a good rate, then our shareholders are happy, and then we're happy. All right. On that note, we got to leave it there. Appreciate Great. your time. Thank you.